this podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Patreon is a monthly subscription that you can cancel anytime. And PayPal is a one-time donation. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And the handle, The Beirut Banyan. And you can find us on our YouTube channel with the same name. And you can start watching the episodes as they're released. Thank you for listening. And thank you for watching. I'm Rani Shatah. And this is The Beirut Banyan. So much to catch up on. I mean, the last time we spoke was in October, late October, and I actually just looked up the date, October twenty third. So that's, I mean, that's just two, three weeks into the protests, and so much has happened since then. And as you said right before we started recording, so much has not happened, and I appreciate that limbo that you described because, in many ways, I feel the same way. I'm going to start by sort of uh, reflecting on a moment that I don't, I don't think I shared with you before on the episode or just in private communication. We met late December 2017 at the, at the cemetery, at the tombs of my father and your father. And I had just returned to Beirut after being away for almost four years. I think I think that was the first night that I had just I just arrived from the airport, hadn't really settled in yet, and I went straight to the to the Dariya. And mm-hmm. uh, I was there alone, just sort of I had not seen it. Because prior to then, and you would remember this, it wasn't the way it looks now. I mean it was just sort of a makeshift tent and a lot of uh, well it was a makeshift cemetery in a way, but in Martyrs Square, the location says it all. And uh, I just sort of noticed someone approaching the the tombs, and it was your mom. And we just sort of, we knew, we knew each other, but I I think we had only met maybe once prior to then. And we just sort of started talking. And I saw you and your brother in the background. And... (laughs) I don't think we spoke. I think we just sort of, we were all there, sort of, in a way, I mean, mourning. But uh, that's the first time we met. And I think it's crazy because these kinds of moments happen in Lebanon, but they don't really happen other places where I would literally not expect anyone to show up there at that time. It was rather late, let alone the son, the family, the wife and and, I mean just relatives of the person buried right next to my father and I think it's it's very symbolic I think and uh, I appreciated that moment and I also appreciated getting to know you later uh, just by having you on the podcast but this is the first time I've seen you since then so in two and a half years we both have expired greatly you, my friend, have now become an adult. You're now a jaded old man with corona hair and beard and co. I'm, an, you know, I'm approaching 40. I'm, I'm losing it. I have gray hair all over the place. We looked yeah. better. We looked better before. <laughs> and I'm going to blame it on COVID-19. I'm not going to blame it on anything else. Maybe a bit of stress from Lebanon too, but it's a bad blend. It's a terrible it's a blend. But it means a lot. It means a lot to now consider you a friend. I think it's very important that uh, that these two men are buried side by side. And I think it's also extremely important that what we've seen the last eight, nine, ten months in Lebanese history, I'm, I'm speculating here, but I have a very good feeling, they would both be very proud of a lot that has happened. I think they would be immensely supportive of the euphoria that we saw. And I... I still believe in that. I'm guessing you do too, but we can explore all of the above. It was a very long introduction. Now, wouldn't that be tragic if that's just the whole episode and I click end? <laughs> it's like, bye, Buzz, I'll speak to you another time. <laughs> I want just your own reaction 
to maybe in a way to your own life. I mean, you're somebody who's been impacted personally by the endless problems of Lebanon. And that includes, and I, I, I assume you share this opinion, there's just no accountability in this country. There's just no proper accountability. There's no justice. And yet you're still in Tripoli. I happen to be stuck abroad, but I intend to return. But just your own reaction, I, your own immediate reflection on where the protest movement is today, and also on the other side, where the status quo, where the regime, where the structure, the system is. And if you see anything sort of, if you see anything positive happening, if you see anything that's maybe negative to the, to the point that the state may actually collapse, may actually implode, just your own reflections on where we are 10 months into the protest movement. I mean, honestly, I believe like, uh, I was talking to someone about the protest, and I think the problem with our generation is that we're looking for quick rewards, like instant gratification, or like the generation of instant gratification. Uh -huh. So I'm kind of seeing a lot of massive disappointment in the protest, more like demoralization, because they saw it more as a sprint rather than a marathon. And I completely agree with that point of view, at least the point of view that the other person uh, told me about. Because it's not just about going to the streets, blocking roads, I don't know, breaking uh, certain public uh, offices. I mean, that's like as a first phase to like express your anger. But then there's uh, the institutional phase, at least that's what I would call it. Mm -hmm. Like this where the protesters should gather up right, and right. use the institution to make changes. Like, some people would say, yeah, but the institutions are built to stop you from making changes. But, like, there's no other way because they're, the political parties that are currently in the system are hell-bent on not changing it. So your only way in is through the system itself. And that's where you, uh, like, if I'm not mistaken, like, in history, some colonies in Africa managed to gain their independence because the people who were in these colonies got into the institutions and they made changes through those institutions. So this is like a very important part for the protests in order to achieve their goals. And this isn't should be this shouldn't be like something year or two years long. This is like a ten years project. Like a very long project. So you're, I think you're in, in a way you sympathize in a way that it's taking time. In other words, you understand the the you have patience in that sense. Yeah. I mean, the problem is that besides the protests, there's a lot going on in the region. You have the war in Syria, the war in Yemen, which, funny enough, is having an effect on Lebanon. Because one of our political parties decided to, you know what, let's go have fun there. You that's know that's definitely the most diplomatic, comedic explanation of what's going on. I, I have not heard it described that way. I'm going to take that from you. Yeah. <laughs> Regional yeah, excursions. You have what's going on between Iran and the US. You have between Iraq and the US. This is all having a major effect on Lebanon. And the problem is, us as protesters, we can't really do much about it. This is out of our hands. What we can do is work locally. But we always have to take into consideration the external factors that can have an impact on our goals. But let me. I'm going to explore this a bit, and I, as somebody who's living in a city that rose up and rose up and shined, I mean, Tripoli, if we look back, I think years from now, that's going to be one of those markers that we look at and say that this Tripoli did its job, did it well. Do you think that the patience of the average person who protested in October, November is gone? Yes. Not the... I mean, I, I, and I sympathize with what you're saying. And of course, it, yeah, I mean, if you look back and I think most examples, you can't expect this instant gratification that, that you described earlier. But do you think the average person today that supported the protest movement in its inception is still willing to push and push and push, given that 
there's been so much economic pain and, and particularly the last few months where we've seen every form that is every financial crisis that you can imagine hitting a country hit Lebanon, let alone hyperinflation. So just do you think that sentiment is shared by the average protester that they're still willing to push knowing that it's a very long process? I don't think they have the patience, to be honest, because mm. right now, I mean, you can see people are barely protesting in Tripoli anymore. Right. Dollar is like 9,000 for the dollar. Like imagine people were going down the streets when it was 1,700, exactly. when they opposed the big dollars tax. Now it's 9,000 and you see barely, very few groups on the streets and they're quickly dispersed by the army. Yeah. I think people right now are just thinking about surviving. Like they just want to survive. They just want to feed their kids. That's pretty much what they're thinking about. They don't care to put it like without any uh, insults. They don't care about the politicians. They don't care about the government. They just want to live. It's a very bleak event that's going on in our country, but this is the consequences of those years of politics. I'm going to push on this because that's a conversation that I have regularly about <clears throat> that. I mean, there are structural reasons why we reached where we are today. Can you share, can you elaborate on that sentiment? The, that this is not something that just happened in, in, in October or for that matter, didn't just sort of happen the last few years. This is a systemic problem. Can you explain on that? What, what do you see as the, as the main components that keep Lebanon where it is, despite all valiant efforts of protesters or the occasional politicians that actually maybe speak up, or, or for that matter, anyone, anyone willing to push. What, what is the, what do you see as the maybe the the core reasons why Lebanon reached where it is today? I mean, sectarianism aside, we have the corruption, lack of accountability, mismanagement. Yeah, you also have, I think because I had a conversation uh, with one of the higher up politicians. You, and my friend, you are very good at that, by the way. I'm just going to interrupt you because every now and then you go on Instagram or Facebook. I don't know where you are. You just sort of show up online and you say something to that effect, but then you disappear. <laughs> it was like, it's like you, you will let your feelings out. You may like point in, the, in a certain direction and then you vanish for months. <laughs> so, yes, I like that. A high-ranking official. It's like, who? I mean, you know, it's... <laughs> I mean, I can't by that. Just, like, give the necessary information. Don't give more than uh, is necessary. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and you just sort of... It's 1% of the story. But, but please, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, they describe the problem in a very simplistic but accurate way. The problem is, in Lebanon, are the Lebanese people. Like, we have a problem in our DNA. There's something very wrong in our DNA that carries, makes us carry on in this dysfunctional society. Like, normal people, I mean, if, I believe if you take any European nation, put it where Lebanon is, it would be different by now. But we Lebanese have this <clears throat> issue where we need a leader. Like, we don't have a purely individualistic way to see things. We don't think like we can be leaders in our own way. No, we have to follow a certain person. This guy knows everything. He's the wisest. He's, you know, the idea. And as long as we have this psychology, this mentality, I don't think we're going to get out of our problem. Like we need to solve our own problems first as a society, as people, before we solve the government's problem, because the government is a reflection of its own people. Yeah, but but what what do you, I mean? I mean, I, I will. I'm I'm not not to challenge what you're saying. I'm curious though what you mean exactly by it that it reflects the people. In other words, do you really <coughs> do you think the makeup of the current regime is a proper reflection of the average Lebanese citizen? Do you, do you see that relationship as more or less appropriate, or or is there is there something missing from that? that reflection that in other words it only represents maybe a certain a certain component of the of 
of modern Lebanese politics. That is all the things that you described, that sort of communalism, that uh, crony relationship among leaders, and, and maybe that sort of a very, very mismanaged economic society that we live in, where you have to depend on a Zaim rather than your own personal merit. So, I mean, do, do you see that relationship as, as appropriate, that this regime, or any Lebanese regime for that matter, is an accurate reflection of, of the society? I mean, I wouldn't say it's an accurate reflection in 100%. Right, so let's yeah. say about 18, 85%. Because oh, even, okay. yeah. like, everyday life, you can see corruption happening. Like, for example, I'm going to give a very clear example. I'm going to take myself as an example. I'm driving on a highway, 120, I'm just like having the blast, driving really fast, and then suddenly I just see the camera flashing in my face. What's the first thing I do? I pull up my phone, hey, can you take away uh, my fine? But that's not you. That's no, not, that is, yeah, yeah, that is you. Yeah. Oh, you're admitting to this. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so no, I'm, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're saying this. Okay, so you, you do, you do take advantage. Of that sort of, yeah. oh. So I'm in my position. I'm able to take advantage of these things. Why would other people not do it? And I, you can see it. For example, even a triple, like the tripolitans. For example, he's going to buy uh, some stuff from I don't know a mechanic. The mechanic tells him, "Okay, since you're my friend, I'm gonna give it to you for a hundred thousand." When a stranger comes to his place, he's like, "Yeah, I'll send for his for three hundred thousand." Hmm corruption like it's also in our everyday life can you expand on this because I, I i don't think i've heard someone be being that honest before on on these episodes that you're admitting that you fall into the and I, this is a very loose term here for the moment corruption i'm not saying that you are a corrupt person but you're taking advantage of a loophole which is uh you are given certain leniency maybe when it comes to something like a speeding ticket. But for those reasons, you don't expect the average person to, to do better. Did I get that right? That the standards are, that are so low that it's, it's really individual action, that you would have to do things the right way. And, and even if people are not handling it the right way, it's up to the citizen. And I'm trying to get I mean, the, yeah. The point I'm trying to develop is that we're not, we're not bad people per se, but we take advantage of the system that we criticize. Hmm. The very system that we want to topple, that we criticize, that we just want to see burn to the ground. We also take advantage of it. Yeah. So like, eventually the Lebanese people need to decide, do I want to keep taking advantage of it and live in the system, or do I want to get rid of it without benefiting from its advantages anymore? And this is where I go back to the point where people still follow their Zayim's like they hate them, but yes. they're still taking benefits from them in the clientelistic system. So which one, which side do you want to pick? Do you want to keep following your Zion for the benefits, or do you want to like take down the system and bring up a, like a proper democracy and a secular state, as some would claim? Now, among your peers, among your friends that that protested, and among those that maybe didn't, and among sort of just your your social sphere, do you sense that? There is an appetite for that fundamental change, knowing that the benefits, the, the benefits the way you describe them, would not necessarily be there, but they're ready to turn the page and try something else. Do, do you sense that there's a willingness, or is it still a reluctancy that most, most, not just your own friends, but maybe most Lebanese, maybe, are not ready to fully move on from this method of, of governance? No, I think most of them believe, like most of them are willing to drop the benefits, but they don't have the patience for it. It's mm. like going back to the difference between a sprint and a marathon. Yeah. You were still the generation of instant gratification, and that's a huge problem, not just in Lebanon, just all across the world. Like we believe change is going to, like, that's it. We went to the streets. We closed the roads. We protested. We burned tires. They're just gonna be like shaking in their boots. They're gonna change, but like ten months in, and still nothing happened. Or I, well, things happen just for the worse. I'm okay. So that's actually a very good point. 
I, I share a bit of that sentiment as well, that, that, that the developments that happened, even if they have positive side to them, there has been a net negative, not, not just in economic stuff, I think across the board. I'm going to ask you first, now maybe I'll interject, uh, but what do you see as the, as the most obvious negative consequences, let's say, knowing that the aspirations may be legitimate and appropriate, but that there has been a, uh, there's been collateral. I mean, the most obvious one is the economic crisis. But I think the other problem is how the protesters were played, basically. And that's the point I've raised to one of my friends. I basically told him, like, <clears throat> the protest failed by the, by the protesters' own hands. Because I think, I believe you remember when the politicians were like, okay, we want to talk to the protesters. Gather up together, get yourself a bunch of leaders, take them to us so that we can have a discussion with them. And I think that was like a reverse psychology kind of trap. It's like people started thinking, oh, they want us to do this, so we should do the opposite. And in the end, the protest stayed leaderless and nothing came out of it. In the end, people are just going in the streets randomly, going to break stuff randomly. There's no there are clear visions of what the people want, but they're not set in, how to explain it, in a concrete text. Hmm. Like in concrete ways where you can uh, see them. Like we know we want secular state, we want fairness, we don't want sectarianism, but how do you go about to bring those visions to life through what policies? But are you, are you referring to, I'm trying to remember now the time frame, was this in january when that kind of that there was this sort of opening let's say to the protest movement or, or are you referring to sort of the the days leading up to hadidi's resignation that it's more on the sort of uh, prior to his resignation which which side was what, what were you referring to when the protesters were sort of offered that that uh what have you well, post your resignation. So, so that's maybe, I, I, I think I remember this right, it's in January, I, or maybe uh, yeah. earlier. Yeah, I'll, uh, telling them come to Babda and let's yeah. have a talk about. But by, imagine, I'm just going to ask you, yeah, because uh, otherwise we will sink together on the Titanic. Is maybe, uh, <laughs> now we have a new background from Mezen Hassan. <laughs> the, yeah. You have uh, so many backgrounds to choose from. <laughs> I, I like the bedroom, different angles of the bedroom. So now we, we go from the bed to the closet. <laughs> but sorry, I interrupted you. You were saying um, that, so you think that organization at that stage would have been a better decision than the fluidity, which in many ways, I think, I think back then was seen as a positive, that it was so nameless and so leaderless, that there were advantages to that. But you're saying that, in other words, the organization should have started at least back then. Yeah, because right now you can see the effects of a lack of organization and leadership. It's just all over the place. No one really knows what's going on anymore. People have been demoralized. People are just like looking to survive because they see that there's no more purpose to this whole thing. Right. Like it failed again. It's like in 2014. 2014 meaning the Ustink movement? The two, yeah. Two, okay, yeah. I, um, then let me throw a question out to you. I'm, I'm going to give my own opinions here, but before that, I just want a final, final question on that. Were you expecting something like politics as usual, that the protest movement would turn into a political party and have a, what is familiar to Lebanon, just like a, one of the crowd, where it might not have that many votes, but it would enter parliament? It would do politics as usual, enter elections, and sort of go that route? Or were you expecting something different, that this would sort of uh, shake the regime? Because I'm curious, I'm curious what organization would have led to and what the exact benefits would have been at that stage for where we are right now. I mean, I would have seen more as politics as usual, but the difference is this is like, a party that genuinely represents the people rather than a certain sect as the other parties would uh, represent. Mm. And 
basically, this is where I mentioned before the institutional phase. This political party or this organization will go into the institutional phase to make changes through these institutions. Right. Like, yeah. basically infiltrate the system and change it. It's kind of like a virus. We, we are the virus to these politicians. I see. So, in other words, that's the fundamental difference between reform and revolution, that you were maybe hoping for a reform-led re re revolution, so to speak. That this would sort of yeah, I mean, enter and break from within a revolution in the sense that we know it like off with their heads french revolution uh, american revolution that's kind of a thing of the past yeah and the problem with lebanon you can't have a proper revolution like the ones we've seen in history because it's a multi-headed dictatorship <laughs> i'm just gonna put it out there it's a multi-headed dictatorship who are you gonna point your fingers at, because if you're going to say, for example, Michel, all, all the Christians that support him are going to go against it, are going to tell you you're being a sectarian person. Mm -hmm. If you're going to say, Nabih Shias are going to do the same. If you say, well, not Hassan Diab, but Sa'ad al-Hariri, the Sunnis are going to uh, say the same thing. So either you have to need to have a unified stance on all the political leaders, or you just have to find a way to commit to this revolution, but through education and institutional changes. You know, I did an episode recently with Nasser Yassin. He was the interim director of uh, Isam Ferris Institute in, um, in AUB. And uh, he described the, what, you're de what you're describing, he referred to it as an octopus. That you have eight legs that regenerate every time you sort of try to, you know, remove one leg, it grows back. That you have to sort of get to the brain. And uh, I, I agree with what you're saying, and I, that, that to me is the disappointment that I was going to refer to. That I think the problems of any protest movement in modern Lebanese history has been selective protests. And it's one thing to get Hadidi to step down, which is in itself, it should be considered an accomplishment, at least in terms of protesters are able to affect change. That the prime minister heard that or at least understood what the consequences were if he were to stay, and chose to step down. So that is an accomplishment. Names aside, confessions aside, sects aside. The fact is a leader took it upon himself to, to remove himself from the stage. Also excluding whether or not he shall return to the stage. That's a different story altogether. But the fact is he stepped down. I think there was not enough pressure to encourage other leaders to step down. And I agree with you on that sense that, yeah, you should have seen the Ba'abda protests that happened at the beginning where they went to the highway leading up to Ba'abda. That was just maybe the first step of a hundred steps necessary to get the president to think about resigning. And I, I just, up until now, I still can't imagine this president ever resigning. Oh, um, no, there's no way. There's, there's no, yeah. But, but. For that to even be a calculation, it didn't happen. Speaker of Parliament, aside from a few scuffles here and there that turned violent with his own security, and uh, maybe the, there, there was some, some pushback, but n not enough, just sort of stayed intact. And I always include it, and I think it's probably the one that is left out of the conversation because it's not politics as usual in Lebanon, it's, it's militia as usual, but there was no real pressure on Hezbollah, that Hezbollah did not uh, feel any, other than, other than those rare occasions in Nabati and maybe now and then, even in Beirut, where there were Hezbollah supporters that were thinking twice about Hezbollah's weapons and maybe that narrative, because they felt the economic pain. But nearly, I mean, not even close to an approach. The numbers were never there to actually have Hezbollah reconsider its comfortable status in the Lebanese regime. So those things, I think, would have been necessary to see quicker change in, in Lebanon. But n they, none of them happened. And to me, that, I think, is going, that is the ultimate frustration, that the protest movement that has all of its intentions it, the intentions are very positive you know I, I i'm always impressed when there's people demanding electricity reform in front of the ministry of electricity 
or a minister of tourism, one of his cars is used perhaps to beat up a pro uh, journalist and the Ministry of Tourism, the protests go there. So that's, that's, that's appropriate. But in the Lebanese regime context, it doesn't really do much. And it doesn't? Yeah. And I think of that as maybe the, these are the stumbling blocks that have not uh, been overcome. But somebody like you, who's younger than me, uh, stays in Lebanon and has been injured the same way, meaning that I think we have maybe 2020 vision that we see things clearer than we need to because there's there's this personal loss involved and maybe there's uh, no patience for for certain ideas and the like do you still hold out any hope that you will live to see a better lebanon emerge or do you think this is a country that you'll tell your kids one day that it just didn't work and it sort of it, it sort of faded away into what we're seeing right now, which is a very ungovernable country. I mean, I don't think in my time I'm going to see like the Lebanon that everyone dreams of, but I, I think by the end of maybe my 50s, 60s, I'm going to see like something new being built up, like a better mm -hmm. Lebanon being built up, but not being there yet. Right. Right. It's like how people describe it. It's a little country with big problems. <laughs> yeah, and, and Lebanon as a country, if I'm going to personify it, it has such a huge ego and a multi-personality disorder. I don't know where it was. Are these to going stand. to be bedtime stories for your kids? Like, let me tell you about the little country with a big problem. <laughs> So, so you see it as, as part of your life, that even when you're in your 60s or your later years, you'll be maybe in a different country, but it might not be for the better. It might not be for the better. It might be for the better. It's, mm. Right now, we're kind of, as a lot of politicians would say, we're going into the unknown. Yeah. And that's probably yeah. the only thing I agree with them. <laughs> we're going into the unknown. Right. And I think the fate of Lebanon hangs in uh, the conflict in Syria and Iran's disposition towards the Middle East. Like A lot of people want to talk about Lebanese society and we have to do this, but in reality, me as a person who sees things in a realistic perspective, Lebanon's fate hangs between these two countries. Because they still have a very powerful influence in Lebanese politics. Like, imagine, um, to give an example, if tomorrow Iran decides, like, Hezbollah needs to get rid of its weapons and just become a regular political party, you'll see strong improvements in the economy. That's how we are linked to external factors. That's not going to happen. That would be a miracle. But I'm just giving an example of how things would drastically change if foreign power makes a decision about Lebanese politics. But do you, would you go as far as to say that the fate lies in Iran, or, or for that matter, Syria, or even the way Syria used to run the country before 2005? That we that no matter what we do in Lebanon, we will never be able to rebuild as long as that issue is not addressed. Would you go that far? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like whether the Lebanese people like this answer or not, we are a small country subjugated by external powers. Right. But that, that little sort of speck in Middle East real estate has seen a lot of battles take place in terms of regional conflict. And we're still in that battle. I mean, the fact of the fact that there is a an armed sub-state group that has money coming from an external power 30 years after the civil war ended just shows that Lebanon still matters at least to certain countries at certain times. And other countries have sort of varying influences as well. But that relationship is intact and it grows and it's, it's sturdy. And it's not, it's not threatened by protest movements. Or if it is, it's like it just fractures just a bit, but sort of patches up right away. It's not like Lebanon, it's not a powerful country, obviously. It has no foreign policy. If it has a foreign policy, it's the sub-state groups 
foreign policy, and that becomes by default Iran's, more or less, more or less. I mean, with some wiggle space, but just enough. But I'm, I want to ask you about you now. Oh, there we go. That's Lebanon. <laughs> that, that happens regularly. <laughs> I want to ask you, and I won't keep you too much longer. That's the sign from above, you know, <laughs> that we've, we've spoken too much. When you see news, and I know it's, it's a long time, and I know it's been part of our lives. It's been part of probably your entire adult life. It's been part of mine. The special tribunal, that it kind of shows up now and then on the news. And the last few days, it's been reappearing. And that that verdict is supposed to be issued, I think, in August. Mid-August? August 7. August 7, is that right? Yeah, August 7, right. I know that our fathers are not part of the special tribunal their assassinations are not covered. It's not in their jurisdiction. And I personally think that that's, uh, that speaks volumes. The Lebanese state did not include these, uh, these assassinations in, in the tribunal. But uh, do you hold out any, any, any room for international justice meaning? Meaning that there is a court in The Hague that is doing its job so to speak, it's going to issue a decision and it has to do with the Lebanese assassination. Do you think of the international sphere as something to turn to when it comes to the Lebanese endless sort of injustice? And it's all types of crimes. It's not just these high level assassinations. But the fact is that there are countries that went through that process countries that were torn apart. I mean, former Yugoslavia is one of the more recent examples that there's a healing process when it comes to justice. But it's not at home. It's justice in The Hague. It's in the Netherlands. Do you think that is something that will help heal some of these wounds? Or do you think of it as something so watered down at this point and it's so perhaps so tied in to many other problems that it became sort of like just background noise? That it doesn't, it's not going to be that triumphant moment that many of us, I think, thought it would be back in 2005. I mean, at this point, I see the verdict of the special tribunal as more of a symbolic thing. Yeah. Like, it's not going to, at least not in the near future, it's not going to have any effect on the ground on the Lebanese scene. It's more of a symbolic uh, effect that. For example, maybe March 14, we are going to say we were right and you were wrong and you are the killer. It's a, you know, all that discussion. But in the end, I imagine the other party is going to be like, yeah, we killed him. So what? What are you going to do about it? Yeah, that, I mean, you know, right. So you don't, so I in mean, other words, there's no consequence anymore. Yeah. Like March 14 is basically the polite, corrupt party. If we're going to put it there. And March 8th is basically the, the armed, corrupt thug. So what are you going to do against them? Just like be like, you're a bad guy. Yeah, I am the bad guy. What are you going to do? You know, I've never heard it described this way. There's so many things I've never heard described this way. So I appreciate, I appreciate the way you're, you're, like, you're painting the picture in a sense that, yeah, yeah, that's true. Justice is meant to be blind. But in the Lebanese case, it's sort of like it's so warped into confessional identity and, and, and persistent problems that it's not, it's not the justice that one has seen in other countries. This is sort of, uh, it's at best Lebanese justice, which is what you're describing right now. But it doesn't have any emotional impact on you. That sort of, that, I mean, and I'm curious because I've, I've been trying to understand my own re reaction. And I, I don't think it has, had, it has had any positive impact, at least in the last, the last few weeks when it kind of showed up again. It has not done what it should do. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it had like either a positive or a negative effect. It's more like a neutral thing. It's more of a, well, it was about time kind of feeling. Yeah. Like, this thing has dragged on for way too long. It's about time that this 
should be done with and we should move on. We should know what to do about this because like we've been stuck on this whole STL thing for so long. We've kind of prevented ourselves from seeing past it. Like what's next? What's after that? It's always been STL, 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 but when it's done, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do to at least march on? And at least that's the way I've been seeing things right now. Like I put the whole STL and, investigations thing behind me i've been thinking post stl and that's just sheer year i mean the time and the amount of time it took i think it just there's that phrase that the wheels of justice turn slowly but they don't turn that slowly this is mm -hmm. it's almost like a paralysis rather than movement i want to wrap it up with maybe your own instinctual feeling of this term secularism and the ambition for a secular state. And then, of course, the sectarianism that we grew up in, the sectarianism that our parents grew up in, the sectarianism that made Lebanon famous. And by not necessarily always in a bad way, that the Lebanon still has that way of power sharing that allowed some breathing space among differing communities, differing groups, but it's an outdated model and it, it needs massive reform. And I wonder about that word secularism and whether or not a secular state would be that much better in the Lebanese context. Meaning, meaning that we get rid of the sectarian obstacle. We get rid of the sort of confessional focus that our, our group identity matters. Hopefully it matters less, hopefully but we're still stuck with the same sort of basket of problems that it's not, it's almost like that may not be the biggest problem for Lebanon. It's one of many problems, but it's not the problem. And I just, I can imagine a secular Lebanon being dysfunctional too, and maybe uh, something that could end up in a financial disaster as well. But it's not like um, that seems to solve, that's not the, it's not a domino effect in my mind. It's just one domino that maybe stands alone. Just your own, your own reflection on that. And, and I ask this as somebody who prefers a secular society and somebody who is secular in every way possible, but then looking at the Lebanese story and assuming it'll be a Lebanese secularism, <laughs> which ends up being like the Lebanese dollar. It's a, it's a secularism confined to Lebanon, if you know what I mean. So just maybe yeah. your own reflection on that. I mean, I agree with you. Secularism is needed in Lebanon, but not at this stage. Hmm. Like right now, the biggest problem we have is our own psychology, it's our own ways of thinking. We need to, like, you can't implement secularism with the same mentality that the Lebanese people have, because it will go nowhere. Like, you get, the, the problem with the, the whole idea is that, yeah, okay, you get rid of sectarianism, but Aside from sectarianism, we as Lebanese people suffer from tribalism. People in Lebanon, not all of them, but at least a major part of them, confuse between what sectarianism and religious fanaticism. Like, for example, me as a Sunni, I, I don't always pray. I fast Ramadan. I don't drink. I sometimes, like, you know, uh, smoke a cigarette, although that's also prohibited by religion. But I don't care that much about what it means to be a Sunni. But for example, another person, he doesn't pray, he doesn't drink, he doesn't fast, but he's, uh, how, do you, how do you put it into words? He's, a, he's an extremist when it comes to his own sect. And that's part of tribalist mentality. Like, hmm. I have nothing to do with my religion. But I'm very uh, fanatic about what my sect represents or which group I belong to. So, like, if you put a secular state, it might diminish that in people who aren't that far gone. But it's not going to take it out. It's not going to take sectarianism out of uh, the people. You're just imposing a regime on them, and they're going to fight back against it. So the communal communalism, it really is sort of, it, it overreigns anyone's personal inclination in that sense. That mm -hmm. even though you're, you could be a somewhat practicing 
Sunni, but you're less communal than your neighbor who's maybe going out every night and whatever, doing things that are less religious, but is defending the tribe over everything. And you see yeah. secularism as a way to heal that or maybe mediate that, maybe bring it to a balancing that is better. Yeah, it can bring it to a balance, but again, you can't take sectarianism out of the extremists. You need, it's basically the whole thing about the protests. I think that people need to realize it's education. You need to educate people. You need to show them that this isn't, this way that we've been living has been damaging our country. Secularism is not the solution. It is one of the solutions. But we need to get out of this tribal mentality. We need to have a national identity rather than a sectarian identity. This is what's lacking. In the that's, that's New York honking for you, Mazin. You know, yeah. I wanted to say, and I like that you, you, in a way, what you just said about the identity complex. Yeah, I mean, that, that also to me was a positive moment in the protest movement, that it seemed like there was a new identity being shaped. It's not there yet. It's clearly in its infancy. But there's something new that's coming out of that moment where, where the, the, draw, the, the division lines were not very clear anymore, which was, a, which was a good thing. It was a very good thing. That Tripoli and Nabati, Sherri, Batrun, Beirut, all of the above, were doing similar things together. And it didn't really matter anymore where you were from or what, what God you believe in, so to speak. I mean, what matters at the end of those events is that you were Lebanese. Yeah. And that's the, that's the missing piece of the puzzle in this whole, uh, how does it put it, debacle. Yeah. Well said. Mazen, I, I have a final question for you, and it's something that uh, I'm curious about. Uh, when, you, when you launch a tirade on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, who are the people that call you to say, please delete this right now? <laughs> or Or... Are you the one that's like, you know what, I shouldn't have maybe said that right now. Let me sort of remove it. I'm curious about you because you are quite famous for the occasional outburst. <laughs> I, I look forward to them. To me, it's sort of that's when I know, you know, when Mazin speaks, <laughs> something. <laughs> it's like, like, gotta... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I Usually, if I'm away from Tripoli, I'm like, whew. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, it's almost like the Batman signal. It just shines for five seconds and then <laughs> disappears. So, what is what exactly are you doing at that moment? Are you are you literally sharing your your pain and then regretting it, or or are you deciding that maybe it wasn't the right way to express it? Are people calling? I'm curious what happens because I I would never have the opportunity really to to ask you about this. No, I mean, when I launched my first tirade, <laughs> it was more of a disagree. It was more of a very harsh disagreement, but some people would see it as more of an attack. It was more of me expressing my pain. Uh, my whole family kind of called me. were like, you have to take it down. And I don't know why, but then please stop this. But like, after that event, every time I had the an outburst on Instagram or I had like something I really felt like I needed to share. Nobody ever called me up and like, yeah, take it down. I think because they realize I'm not going to take it down uh, that easily. Does it feel good? Because I, I, I've seen that kind of expression as also part of the protest movement, that people are more bold now to speak their mind. Even if there's consequences, they do it anyway. D do you see that as, as part of the wider story? That people are able to sort of let things out in ways that we were not we were not given the luxury back then that this was maybe let alone we didn't have the tools now we have the tools but that this is born out of that sort of yearning for something better and we're expressing ourselves in, in that way yeah i mean in my case i don't think i have much to fear if I ever criticize uh, Michel Aoun or Gibran Basile. I hope I don't jinx myself right now. <laughs> I mean, I don't expect I'm going to criticize them that the, the army intelligence is just going to be knocking at my door and dragging me away. But like, in other people's case, yeah, it's become part of this new culture, but there are consequences to them. Yeah, right. And it's not like there was any... I, there's, sorry, yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
Sorry, I interrupted okay. you. Well, I don't jinx myself. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I no, I and my, from my experience, having spoken to few people about this, that that that's that thin line, but it's there. It's the defamation. It's the insults. But speaking out with consequence and tirades, knowing that there's the threat of interrogation now for for just for going on Instagram and sharing your pain, uh, that is something start that is something horrible that that Lebanese that I think we had more or less thought of that as something of the past, something of the Syrian era in Lebanon that two thousand and five we had sort of moved on from that, but that yeah. truly is not the case that there are still there's intimidation in uh, social media but i I appreciate those uh, those outbursts sorry, go ahead give me a second I need to open the door for my cat oh, sure of course yeah. <laughs> hello buddy. <laughs> you know the best part about this mesm is that this happened last time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now we can see him. Yes. Oh, that's adorable. What's what's the name? Of... Uh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> it's part of the episode now. <laughs> <laughs> what's your cat's name? Alex. Alex. Oh, sure. That's hey, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think Alex doesn't enjoy this conversation much. Or that's a very, very uh, inefficient way of getting you monitored from this conversation. There's a little chip in Alex and there's another recording device. Mazen, thank you. I'll, I'll let you handle Alex. I think it's sort of, that's, there's signals and we know it's time. I really appreciate you sharing your opinions on these things. And I also appreciate you as someone that I can talk to about, about things that maybe too many Lebanese experienced and we obviously have to sort of handle it and deal with it on our own. But I enjoy, I enjoy reflecting with someone who's, who's been through a similar tragedy and still cares about Lebanon. You didn't run away. You didn't sort of seek life elsewhere and, and give up on the country. You're still in Lebanon. I hope to return later this year. And uh, I think that's what matters at the end of the day, that the injuries yeah. of the country do not prevent decent people from still trying. And uh, for those reasons and many more, I appreciate you joining the podcast again. So thank you. Thanks for listening. And a friendly reminder to help support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box below. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>